Good evening, everybody. It's a joy to be here with all of you. Thank you for coming and sharing this time together to explore some subjects that are really essential to our understanding of life, human beings, and the universe itself. Uh, today, as John said, we are going to explore a subject that is related to the ways human beings have developed in their search for truth, and also how the Theosophical Society relates to these ways. Uh, this is a lecture that commemorates or celebrates the 138th anniversary of the founding of the Theosophical Society, 138 years ago in November 17, um, the Theosophical Society was founded for, for this very same purpose, to investigate, to learn, and to realize what's life, why we are here, and what we are supposed to do. Not that somebody will tell us, we encourage each one of us to, to find out. Um, when the Theosophical Society was founded, Basically, there were these three ways to approach uh, the search for truth, which are still today um, prominent. One was the religious way, through religion. Uh, the other one was the way through science, which at the time, at, at the end of the 19th century, science was kind of at its peak. In, in, at the level of influence in the minds of people. Science was discovering, awakening to all this discovery, and many people began to embrace a scientific view of the world and uh, denying the religious view of the world because it wasn't rational. And then we have also the philosophical approach, the, the approach where we try to figure out or, or philosophers try to understand through reasoning uh, why we are here, what's all this about. So these three paths are or can be characterized or can be exemplified by these three um, images, archetypes, if you want, the mystic, the scholar, and the magus. And I'm going to explain how. Now, the Theosophical Society was founded because, in part, because these three paths were uh, in conflict with, with each other. Philosophy, for many years, had been used to justify religion, and then philosophers were reacting to that. Uh, some philosophers began to have a more uh, scientific or, or atheist uh, approach, and religion and science, of course, were, were fighting. And the Theosophical Society wanted to show how these three paths can be seen as different aspects of one holistic approach. And that's in particular what, what the, this organization proposes, a holistic approach w which, if we see history, there were always movements, organizations that were um, promoting an all-inclusive approach. But at the time, that had been, for the most part, forgotten. So in order to understand this, we need to examine the three paths, how they work, what their aim and means are, and also their pitfalls, because every path has its own dangers. And if we are aware of them, then we can mm, you know, be more careful and not fall into these pitfalls. Now, in order to see this deeper in how they can relate to a whole, I think we need to examine the nature of the deity, of the divinity, God, the ultimate reality, however you want to, to call it. Um, usually, in most traditions, the, the ultimate reality or the, the divinity is is explained, if we can use that term, as having three aspects. You know, these three aspects are explained in different ways, but we could 
summarize this by saying that these three aspects, one of them is being, the aspect of being. Yes, if you cannot see the whiteboard, feel free to move. Uh, one is the aspect of being. The other is the aspect of wisdom. And uh, the other is the aspect of activity. Being is a foundation of every being, every creature that exists in the universe. This being is like the ground, the, the source of life, the source of um, consciousness. So we can say that this is the ground for any life or consciousness. Wisdom is a source, sometimes uh, uh, it is, there is the, the phrase the divine plan, this order that is behind the universe of which the laws of nature are a manifestation. So the wisdom aspect is the aspect of the, what we can call the universal mind or in a figurative way we could say this is the architect, the, the, that as, no, yeah, I think, that, that's the aspect that, um, that originates, as I said, the, the laws, the order that is behind, where the plan, the divine plan is. And then the activity, this is like the, the creator, the builder. This aspect is the actual creative forces that build the universe. So this is one way we can represent this trinity. And uh, although there are several different words that we can use, that's one aspect that, that more or less um, summarizes the different activities that are uh, under, underneath the working of the universe. Now, as we are going to see, these three aspects express themselves in these three paths that we follow to realize truth. So, for example, let us explore the first path, the path of the mystic. When I was thinking of these words, mystic, scholar, megas, uh, none of them were really good for what I wanted to say. Because today, you know, they are used in different ways and they really don't express the full meaning of what these particular paths uh, really mean. You know, with mystic, we re refer to many different things. In the way that I'm applying, a, a mystic, in a technical sense, is that person that seeks union, uh, that seeks identity with the divine or the ultimate reality or the ultimate truth. Uh, the mystic basically seeks union. Now, the mystic path is a path of rejection of anything that is not the ultimate source. You know, we have the idea of unmanifested, invisible, uh, beyond, a, beyond a, a plane that is beyond, and then the manifested, the created plane. Everything we see around, the Christian would say, is the world of creatures, creatures in the sense of created. And then we have the world of the creator, of the source of all this. Or in Eastern traditions, they would say, we have the world of the ultimate reality, and then everything we see here is illusion. Illusion not in the sense that it doesn't exist, but in the sense that it's impermanent, that the way we perceive it is not true, and that ultimately speaking, this is all the divinity, but we see all the differentiation. So, uh, Plato would talk about the world of ideas and the world of, you know, the forms and the objects. So the, the mystic, what the mystic tries to do is to get to the, the world of the ultimate reality, basically by rejecting what is not the ultimate reality. 
So the mystic is trying to retreat from the senses. The mystic tries to retreat even from reasoning and try to stay in a pure state of being where, according to the different mystical traditions, that pure sense of being comes directly from the ultimate reality. So when, when we can dwell in that sense of being, pure sense of being beyond the senses, beyond the mind and all the images, then we are dwelling in the ultimate reality. So basically, that's uh, the, the idea of the mystic path. And then we will see some of the, the, the consequences of this. Um, now, one experience that the mystic has, the person that follows this path has, is that as the person retreats his or her consciousness from the, the regular working of our consciousness, begins to discover new worlds, new states of consciousness. Now, most traditions, they take all these new experiences, new visions, new um, worlds that open up to them. They take them as still being part of the illusion. They, want to, they don't want to dwell on any manifested world. They want to go right back to the source of being. So, for example, in Christianity, and I mention Christianity because probably most of us are more related or, or were raised as, as Christians, but many times in Christianity, they would say any the visions that, that you get, even powers that you may develop, you know, the ability or the gifts that you may develop, they are all temptations from, from Satan to lead you astray. Because you begin by trying to search God and only God in the Christian language. And uh, then you get lost in all these visions and these sensations and these new horizons. And you forget. You forget what you were really looking for. You forget that you were looking for God. And then, you know, from that point of view, there is no much difference if you are distracted by, you know, physical objects of the senses or by psychic objects of the psychic senses, let's say. So they would try to be careful not to get entangled with any new experience. And this is one important point, because when we think of mysticism, many times we think of these experiences or, or feelings of bliss and union. And, and most mystics would say, that is not at all the aim of mysticism. Though things may happen or may not happen, many times the, the experience is not one of, of bliss or pleasure, it's one of you know, emptiness or, or fear or you know, depending on what process a person is going through. But they say that the aim of mysticism is to go beyond that. If you start the mystic path because you want to experience this and bliss and all that, you, you are going the wrong way. That's not the aim of mysticism. A mystic is not the one that has an experience. The mystic is the one that is able to dwell in this pure being. And this pure being is beyond any sensation. We know sensations as pleasure and pain. When, they, when the sensation or when, when the feeling, if we want to call it that way, of being one with the ultimate reality is described, you know, they have to use some words that we know, but they always say this is not, you know, the regular what you normally think of bliss. It's a negation of pleasure and pain, and it's a, a different state. Now, people who really don't, this is one of the pitfalls in this, in this path, is this intoxication with, with experiences. You know, some, some mystics, they, they are, their journey is cut short because they get in, entangled in all this, because they, they lose sight of the idea that any experience is still part of the separation, is still part of the illusion, that there is something that is more transcendental. So that's one thing that the mystic has to be careful about. And then sometimes what happens is that because our culture is so sensual, not in the sense of sexuality, sensually in the, se in the sense of 
the, the need of stimulation through our senses. Because our culture is so, so sensual, we don't know how to enjoy. We have not discovered as a culture, and again, I, I am tempting, tempted to use the word bliss, but then that's misleading. We have not discovered you know, what it is to be in silence, in real silence, not the silence of not speaking when our mind is still producing all the worries and problems that the mind usually produces. We have not discovered what is it to be in the silence of being, not of trying to attain, not of trying to become, not of, of trying to modify, the, the pure silence of being. Now, because we have not discovered that, we, we have a thirst for experience. And if we cannot get the experience through by spiritual means, meaning prayer or meditation or contemplation, we try to fake the experience or we try to produce it artificially. So we, we have, for example, the, the use of uh, drugs as a way to produce experience, so-called spiritual experience, or, you know, turning and, and swirling until it produces a, a, an altered state of consciousness. Or different devices, you know, looking at the at, the, at a flame until a state of hypnosis is produced. So all these different artificial ways to produce a sense of an experience that is not our normal experience. But the problem is that the divine spark is always in each one of us. We don't have to generate to create a spiritual experience. The spiritual experience is what we are. It is always there, always available. We can access that spirit. The, the problem why we are not aware of the spiritual, of our spiritual nature is because our, our mind, our regular mind, is constantly in the way. You know, I, I have used this example before. If we are all speaking here in, in the room and somebody is whispering something, we cannot hear that whisper unless we keep quiet. So every mystic would say, in order for, or, or if you want to hear, to listen to God, you have to stop talking. You have to keep quiet. So the basic problem is that we have to learn how to make our mind quiet. Now, we can do it by artificial means, like, for example, a drug. We can use a drug, and that will disrupt the normal functioning of our, of our mind, and then we will be able to perceive what is beyond, which was always there, is always there. And that is fine, but the problem is that, you know, when we cheat nature, it always comes with a price. So, for example, in the case of, of uh, drugs, it, it has a, a, an effect on our physical body, which ultimately speaking, it, it will close the possibility of contact with the spiritual nature in ourselves. Uh, there are, you know, I don't want to go into too many details because it's, this lecture is not about that, but there are a, a couple of glands in our brain, the pineal gland and the pituitary, that are said to be the, the link to be able to perceive the higher nature. Through alcohol or a drug or some other substances, the, the activity of these glands is accelerated, and when you, you disrupt it, and then it's like the door is open to a, a different kind of consciousness. But then you are affecting these glands. When you do it regularly, at a certain point they stop functioning. So the possibility of perceiving on your through your brain, the higher state of consciousness uh, stops. And there is also like a veil that separates the, you know, the psychic world from the physical world, which nature puts as a protection, that through these substances also, you, you can tear the veil momentarily, and then it will close again. But if you, you, you use these methods constantly, then you rip it open, you know, permanently. And then we, it, it may produce psychic imbalance or even madness, you know, depending on the person. So this is one, one problem in the mystic approach. And we had 
you know, this, uh, um, this in the 60s, we had a lot of activity in, the, in this way. And many of these people, they came to the conclusion that it's not a healthy way to try to seek for spirituality because what we need to do is to learn by ourselves through our conscious action to access the divine. When you, have a, when you are having a problem in life, if you can access the higher perspective, you relate to life in a different way. But if you need a drug to be able to see things from a different point of view, you cannot function in the world. So what, what we need to do is to access these higher states of consciousness through our own uh, will and our own action so that we can dwell there in a healthy way. So this is one of the problems with the mystic and the mystical approach to spirituality. Now, we are going to talk a little more about that uh, later, but basically we could say that the, the mystic is seeking for this, the, the, the ground of being. This mystic, or we could say also, is the saint in religions or, or the savior, the, the, that kind of person, they rep represent the religious path. And, you know, there are people who have a natural tendency to follow that particular path. The religious path in the sense of trying to seek real union by your, your direct perception with the divine. Now let us see the path of the scholar. Again here, when choosing the word, I had a hard time. I would have chosen probably the word philosopher. But philosopher in the sense that Pythagoras and Plato used that word. Philosopher means the person that loves wisdom. You know, philo is love and Sophia is wisdom. When we say philosopher today, we think of the you know, person in, that is teaching philosophy, meaning teaching what other people thought. Uh, but philosopher in the sense of that person that is seeking for to understand truth in every field of nature, to understand the truth about yourself, about the universe, about life, the person that needs to figure, figure out why we are here. The mystic doesn't care about why. You know, the mystic says, I don't care. This is a prison in one way or the other. You know, they see it. Uh, I just want to get out of here. Uh, so that's a particular path. Now, the philosopher or the scholar, you know, with the, the word scholar, I sought for something that was not so specialized. You can, you, when you think of scholar, it can be a scholar or, on any field. So I'm trying to refer to this open-minded uh, approach, not scholar in science, in philosophy or psychology. So the, the mystic doesn't care about understanding. He tries to go beyond senses, beyond thought. The scholar tries to understand, tries to, to see why, why am I here? What's the purpose? Uh, how does it work? And that's a, a path that existed in humanity for as long as the, the religious one uh, existed. So this, um, the, the approach of the scholar or, or the philosopher in this deeper sense is based on reason, but not intellectual reasoning. This pure higher reason, if we want to call it. You know, if you read the works of real philosophers, and by real philosophers I, I mean those who have come up with a particular view of the world and not just repeat somebody else's, they have discovered much before science developed many scientific facts. You know, the Greeks, just by thinking, they came up to the idea that everything has to be uh, made up of atoms. The atoms were discovered by science, you know, not too long ago, but the Greeks known this, you knew this, you know, um, several thousands of years before. And when you see some of their explanations, you say, how did they come to think that something like this that is solid should be composed of indivisible particles? Or to refer to a more modern example, take Leibniz, for example. He was a German philosopher. And in his 
description of the monads, which was like the idea of the atoms, but from the point of view of uh, consciousness, he also came up to some ideas that you say, uh, you know, now that we know science, it all makes sense. But at the time, you know, he would say, for example, that uh, a plant had a monad, meaning a center of consciousness, and that each particle in the plant had a center of consciousness, meaning each atom. And they, but he would say the chair, each particle in the chair has a center of consciousness, but the chair as a whole not doesn't because it was built by us. So what he's doing there, at the time, we didn't know about atoms, about cells, about any of that. But he figured that in the natural beings that are formed in the universe, there is not only a general consciousness, but also each entity that forms that, that entity, bigger entity, has also a center of consciousness, but not things that we, we build. And um, when you start learning about cells and all that, yeah, it makes sense. But at the time, how did he come up to, you know, with this? So the thing is that reasoning, the deep reasoning, can touch the, the source of wisdom, the source of the universal mind. Now, the knowledge that philosophers in the, in the, in the deep sense um, can attain is a universal knowledge in the sense not a particular knowledge. They couldn't describe how the atom actually was. Protons, neutrons, electrons around. They could never come you know, to, that, to that view. Actually, when philosophers tried to work on that level, like Descartes, for example, he tried to explain how the, wor the heart worked, and, and he made a mess of it. But philosophers, they touch the plane of the universals, the universal principles, and science works on the other end, as we are going to examine. It works on the, on the plane of the details, on, on the phenomena. The philosophers go to the noumena, which means the cause, the source. And science goes to the phenomena, the appearance, the manifestation. Philosophers work with universal, science work, works with the particular. So the point is that the Greeks, for example, they said, you know, if you have two kinds of knowledge, the one that comes through your senses and the one that comes through your reasoning, the reasoning is a higher knowledge. And they will, you know, you can see, for example, your senses tells you or tell you that the sun is rising over the horizon when we know that is, it is not true. And uh, our senses are misleading in many ways. But they would say, if you know how to reason, if you know how to access this state of consciousness, you can see the truth. And that is a path that exists. And many of these philosophers, even Einstein, Einstein was more a philosopher than a scientist. He never made, did an experiment by the pure you know, reasoning that he applied, he discovers the, the laws of the, several laws in, of the universe. So this is a path, the path where you seek wisdom by applying the pure reasoning. And uh, those who, who are really, you know, on that path can, can really attain things that are amazing. Now, of course, this also has some pitfalls. One is uh, what was Socrates' um, number one, you know, public enemy, which were the sophists. These people that use knowledge, use oratory, not to discover truth, but to manipulate truth. Mm, a typical example, then and now, is a politician. You know, you start, not all politicians, but, you know, that's basically, actually I read some, uh, somewhere that uh, many of the politicians are incarnations of the old sophist, Greek sophist. And I can totally see how that could be. But the idea, you know, you use, you are smart, you are cunning, and you, you don't care about looking for truth. You just want to get what you want. And you convince people, you, you mislead people and try to make them believe something that is not. So that's one of the problems when a person begins to develop this deep reasoning, 
Many times that person sees that he can make a lot of money with that and begin to do these things. Another problem is, you know, these people may develop a sense of um, uh, pride or, or become cold, you know. The, if you emphasize too much the intellect, you, you may begin to shut off the emotions. Um, so that, that's another, another problem. Uh, also, another problem is that you may, you may not be able to touch the universal mind, to get in touch with this plane of universal truth, and only stay at the level of the lower mind. And that degenerates in a, an empty intellectualism, which in philosophy, modern philosophy, many times is just that, you know, and that's why people don't care about philosophy for the most part, because it's irrelevant. It, it becomes irrelevant just amusing over concepts that, you know, don't, are not relevant. So that's one of the problems with this particular path. And, uh, and then we have, so let us put here, so this would be the, the path of the scholar. And we could relate it to philosophy, but again, remember, philosophy in the sense of trying the love for truth, trying to understand whatever it is, science, art, psychology, but the, the approach to trying to understand. And then we have the last um, way, which again, when I was trying to figure out a word, I didn't find one that really represented this. I chose the, the word magos, which is related to, you know, magic, but again, magic, we could say magician, but when we think of magician, we think of tricks. We could use the word wizard, but usually we relate it to sorcery or some kind of like that. Um, the, the idea of the magus, this was a, is a word that was used with, in a very old religion, the Zoroastrians, the Persians. And uh, the idea there was this person that was a priest, but also he was able to dominate the elements of nature. He was a healer. He was able to, to see things that normal people couldn't see. It's all this aspect of the, the hidden side of nature, the hidden side of the human being. Uh, we see in India sometimes the, some yogis, especially the Hatha yogis, not like the Hatha yoga that we know here. Uh, in India, the Hatha yogis have a, a very very hard discipline, and they develop some psychic powers. They develop some um, abilities, or, or like the uh, fakirs, which are Muslims, and they can, you know, walk on fire or sleep on on beds with nails or all kinds of feats, uh, physical feats. So the the idea is there is a path, the the path of the magus where the person is trying to investigate into the nature of matter and energy, and also consciousness, but not, the, not necessarily the physical matter. You know, science is related to this path also. Uh, the, the, in the, this path is a path where, of course, you use reasoning, but the reasoning is not the main, the main approach. The main approach is testing, perceiving the senses, whether these are your physical senses, your psychic senses, or the extension of, of your senses that are all the technology that we develop. You know, when I, when I work with the DNA in, in the lab, that's an extension of my senses. I can see it because I generate a technology, or we as humanity generate a technology to see the, the DNA, and in science, if you cannot measure, if you cannot perceive in some way something, it doesn't exist. It's not a scientific reality. So, the, as we said, the basic path for the scholar was this pure reason. The, the path for the mystic was not reason, was going beyond reason. And the path for the, the scientific path for the magus or, or even the scientist is basically the senses. So the, 
the idea is that what, is, what does science look for? You know, what is seeking? Science is trying to understand the world, the world not in a religious way, not in a philosophical way, but by discovering how it is composed, how it works, what laws are there, how they can manipulate the world. And the same is for, for this, um, you know, the, the, ma the magus is a person that is trying to extend, not only on the physical plane, but also to discover how these subtle forces, subtle entities, angels, elementals, these forces, you know, the power of thought, uh, and not only the, the, the power of physical uh, force, uh, or what kind of states of consciousness are there besides our, our waking consciousness? Can we become aware in the dreams? Can we become aware beyond that? All this path is a scientific path, of course not scientific in the, in the sense of, of um, limited to the physical, but it's the, the path w where the, the person learns, as I said, to manipulate the energy and the matter on different levels. Now these are the, you know, we, we are more related to the idea of a wizard that is able to move the elements, to command the elements and the energies there. And that's a, a path that exists. You know, in the past, it was much more prevalent. Now the manifestation of this particular path, as I said, is science. And uh, science is getting to do many things that were done by magicians in the past. You know, to send messages across the, the, other, the other end of the world, to produce speaking things, to, you know, all these things were done in the past by magicians, by other means. And now science does it by technology. So the idea is to expand the field of activity not only on the physical plane, but on the inner planes in the path of the uh, magos. Now, one of the problems here, one of the pitfalls, and probably is one of the most dangerous of the three uh, ways, is to develop what we could call black magic. In the sense that, you know, we do it also at the scientific level. Madame Blavatsky, one of the founders of the Theosophical Society, she, she several times said, uh, science sometimes is just black magic. In what sense? In the sense that we, di we discover how to manipulate a force and we use it to harm others, like the atomic bomb. We discovered the, the power that was in the atom, we created the atomic bomb and used it. Then, or, you know, we learn how to manipulate bacteria and microorganisms and then we want to use them also usually in warfare or trying to dominate others. Or, so that, since this path is related to doing, to acting, the more you learn, the more you can help or you can harm people. That's why this path is related to activity to the aspect of activity in the deity. This path is a creator. We have created a different world. If you compare to how the animals work, you know, how the animals uh, live, we have created a new world. And we create, now we can clone and we can create, you know, beings. Uh, it's, it's part of, you know, the path of the divinity, the creative aspect that is able to, we, we are able to do that to a certain extent. Um, on our own plane as human beings. Now, as I said, this gives you a power, and if you start seeing that you can manipulate these forces, and you can get a benefit from it, and you start using it in that way, then you start falling into the path of um, you know, black magic. And then you, you don't care about harming other people to get what, what you want, which we many times do by legal means, you know, many times we want something that damages somebody else, but we say, oh, well, you know, I'm sorry, that's fine. And if we have an extra power, power that people normally don't have, we may be very well tempted to just do the same. And that's how the path of black magic uh, develops. So another problem is that the person may get lost in, you know, psychism and all, because this also opens up, as in the mystic, opens up your perception to inner worlds. 
So, um, you know, some of the, of the problems, each dimension in the universe or plane in the universe is a whole world with a whole lot of entities, good, bad, neutral, and uh, many people get entangled there and, and really, you know, have a lot of problems. So, as we see, this, as I said, could be called, you know, the scientific uh, path. Again, using scientific in, the, in a wider sense. I'm using all these words in a wider sense. Um, as we see, there are these three paths. They are expressions of different aspects of the divinity, and they have this this, the, these possibilities as well as these dangers. So all this happened in humanity many times, people misusing any of these paths or falling into the traps of these paths. So what the Theosophical Society proposed is a path where we can integrate the three of them. The Theosophical Society, and I'll show you through the, the three objects, its three objects, is, is telling us that we should try to tread the three paths together. Of course, each one of us has a particular inclination, you know, but when we try to tread the three paths, they balance each other. Because, for example, the mystic if it is not in, in a balanced, or, or it's easy if you, if you are too specialized in one path to become unbalanced. unbalanced. For example, the mystic many times becomes very emotional or fanatical or even hysterical. We have, we have many examples of that in, in history. Or the scholar may become proud, you know, insensitive, cold, unable to relate to the normal world. We have all these geniuses. Most of the geniuses are, are a genius in one particular field, and they, they are a mess in all the rest of life. You know? And that's not the purpose of life. We have to grow holistically, not to excel in one particular thing and being so poor in, in all the rest. As a, as a human being, we are a totality. So that's part of what, what the TS began to say, you know, yeah, you can be the best in one particular field, but in your, in your development as a human being, that is harmful. We have to grow, you know, holistically in a, in, in a complete way. So the first object of the Theosophical Society is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood without any distinction. So universal brotherhood means you know, to generate, why a nucleus? Because we cannot go out and convert people and force them to look at things in the way we look at things. You know, so all you can aspire is to, to provide a place where those who agree on that, who feel the call to that, uh, can come and work together. So to form a nucleus, and universal brotherhood means a sense, you know, to be brothers, meaning we come from the same source, so we all share the same source, and universal in the sense that we all means all, not only the members of the TS, or only the Catholic, or only the Hindu. The universal brotherhood is to develop in ourselves this sense that we all, with the whole humanity, with the murderer and with the saint, we all share the same source. And that you know, we can talk about that, but to actually realize it, we need to tread the mystic path. We need to, dis to perceive the unity of, of life, the unity of consciousness. So the first aim is pointing out to the mystic path. Then the second aim is to do a comparative study of religion, philosophy, and science. That, that idea is related to the scholar. The idea is that when we try to look at the world from all different angles, at the world, people, life, ourselves, from all different angles, we get a much more uh, balanced view. You know, 
you know how the scientist looks at the world and dismisses usually, you know, anything that psychology, philosophy, religion, art has to say. And that is a lopsided view of the world. The same with, with a religious people, person that, you know, is fanatical and still says that the world was created, you know, 5,000 years ago. Well, well, that's fine, but it's just, you know, I don't want to go into personal beliefs, but the idea is that, you know, there is a view that integrates all of that. And that view allows you a deeper understanding of the world. So the second uh, aim of the Theosophical Society is, is related to, the, to wisdom, to the way of the scholar, to generate in us that wide understanding. Not necessarily very detailed. You know, it's not that you have to become an expert in religion, philosophy, science. It's just to begin to nourish in yourself this wide view. And then the third aim of the Theosophical Society is to investigate the unexplained laws in nature and the latent powers in man and human beings. And that is related to the third, the third path, the path where we begin to, the, the aim, the object says investigate, not necessarily develop, because the idea is that since this is a science, the first thing we have to do is to know about it. You know, Mary Curie, she died with poisoning, with the radioactivity, because she didn't know. She didn't know that she was handling these, these elements and that that was killing her. And that's what happens many times. If we don't know what we are dealing with in, on this path, we may be harmed, we may be killed. Many scientists died. So the idea is that the path of the Magus the first thing we have to do is to study, to investigate, to understand how things work. And then we can actually uh, flourish in that particular path. So in the theosophical tradition, and with this uh, I finish, the idea is that a real, or the real aim of a theosophist is to try to grow in the three fields at the same time in a holistic way. As I said, we may have a tendency more marked than the others, but if we try to, to walk the three paths, then the others will bring balance to our natural tendency. And when all these paths are developed in us to a certain extent, then that person becomes what in the, in the theosophical tradition we call an occultist. Occultist in the sense of not so much in the way that, that the word is used now, but this person that, is, that has attained union with the divine, that has attained you know, wisdom, and that is able to become a co-worker of nature because it knows how the, the laws of nature work with the aim of helping human evolution, and not only human, but evolution in general in the planet. So that's more or less what the, when the Theosophical Society was founded, that's what, what the organization proposed. You know, trying to, to tread this holistic path so that we can become helpers of humanity uh, with the characteristics of each one of us, but in a way that will be safe for us and for the rest. So that's more or less what I wanted to share with you. Um, as I said, the, this um, was to, you know, as a celebration of, of the founding of the Theosophical Society, but regardless of that, uh, I think we should try to see, to learn about ourselves and see what's our tendency, what things we lack, what things may help us grow in this more uh, holistic way. And I hope, you know, that this can be a pointer for you to, to look into that. On your being, you mean groundwork, like a foundation? Uh, she's asking if under, under being, I mean the ground. Uh, sometimes in some philosophies, they talk about the ground of everything as being this being. So that's the ground, the foundation, the source. You know, maybe if you want to put the word uh, source, 
So, uh, so the divine or or God is often uh, talked about as the three omnis: omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient, which you know corresponds, yeah, corresponds with that to your uh, three. So uh, this is omnipresent, this is omniscient, and this is omnipotent. Right, mm -hmm. and so these are three aspects of one one non-thing or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the idea is that if you can understand any one of those, those omnis, uh, you understand all three or something like mm -hmm. that. Yes, when these paths are talked about, the, the idea is that they all lead you to the same. When you get there, you get to the same place. Now, the problem is the path itself. The reason why theosophy usually recommends you know, this approach is to prevent you, as far as possible, from falling into the, the problems of, of one particular path. Now, many people have traversed you know, one particular path without falling into any of the pitfalls, but many others have not. So, the, um, the idea in the, in the theosophical approach is that as you do it, you know, holistically, then it's, a, it's safer. And also there are some other things that, you know, for example, this, there are these jnanis in India, uh, like Nisargadatta that, that you and I like, and uh, he had this omniscience, not necessarily the, you know, omnipotence of all these cities or powers, and he said, if you want to develop that, you, you have to, in particular, follow a, a particular kind of yoga. So the, the, aim of the, the, well, the aim of becoming an occultist in the theosophical approach is to become this person that is able to help in human evolution, and for that you need to realize the truth, to, to become one with the deity, you, you need to have wisdom as to how everything works, and you need to have the, the ability to become a, a, a co-worker of nature. So that's why also in the theosophical approach, the three things are you know, encouraged. I'm thinking about art as a spiritual path, and artist could be a, a painter, a calligrapher, a dancer, um, Zen gardener, musician. I'm thinking that that is probably a mystical path. Mm -hmm. um, can you see a situation where it would be one of the other paths? Yeah, I, I thought about that when, you know, when preparing the, the talk. And um, I, I also related art to the mystical path. Uh, but, you know, usually I think art is more a skillful expression of a truth perceived than the seeking of the truth. You know, that's why I think when we talk about these paths, art is frequently not mentioned, not because it is worthless, uh, not, not at all, but because, you know, art is like the, like the expression, the, the mystic had this experience and then in poetry, in painting, in, or even in sculpture, that was the way that, that he brought that vision down to the world of manifestation. So maybe art, you know, is like, um, like the skill to, to express the, the perception of truth. I don't know how much, although I, I know that, you know, the practice of art tends to develop the intuition, the higher emotions, and all that. I know that it can be a discipline in that way. But um, yeah, I would, I would include art in the mystic path, and um, as I said, more as this skillful expression of, of the view of the divine. And a follow-up, what about healers? Where do they fit into this? Healers. Yeah, I would put the, the healers more related to, to the, the path of the magus. Um, you know, many of them, the druids, and the Magos in the Zoroastrians, and they, they all uh, were, were healers also, because they know about, and, and then the healers like the physicians are part of the scientists. So to me, that whole path 
the healers would be more or less in that path. Of course, we have to remember that, you know, any, any, we can organize things in different ways. We can classify them in different ways. There are different models. You know, they, uh, we cannot expect <clears throat> one particular model to cover everything. But it, it, it is a, an expression of a particular universal principle. But uh, fortunately, life and the universe is far more creative than we can enclose in any system. I'm just intrigued by the, the scholar section there. Can the, can the scholar ever get outside the bounds of their knowledge? It seems like there would be a limit there as to how far they could really go. Yeah, uh, that is, you know, in, in the theosophical um, view of human beings, we have, our mind has two aspects, what we can call lower mind and higher mind. The lower mind is a mind that is focused on the effects. The higher mind is the one that is focused on the laws, the origin, the, the sources. The effects are always concrete. You know, we have, it's the, what normally in philosophy is called the particulars. Um, the, the laws are always abstract, they, it's the universals. So when you work at the level of the effects, the particulars, you, you, you can be trapped in the, in the knowledge. There, are, there is infinite knowledge of effects in the sense that there is infinite you know, uh, diversity in the world. In, if I am a, a microbiologist and I, couldn't I could spend my whole life trying to understand one species of bacteria of the thousands that are there. You know, because if you go to the world of effects, there is so much detail and knowledge. So many times that is what happens. But the, the way to break through that barrier is to always try to go to the source, to the law and not the phenomena, to the source and not to the production. And that's what they, all the great thinkers and philosophers in this deeper sense did they were able to break through and get in touch with the universal mind, with the source of the patterns. You know, you see, you see like the archetype, which later on will manifest in many different ways. Science looks at the different ways it manifests, but this, the scholar or philosopher tries to, to understand the, the, the archetype. So in that way, you are not caught in knowledge, you develop wisdom as we see in Plato or many others.